extrapolate these out to adults as well. There are some things on there that are unique with pediatrics, including the big one being basal glare. Uh, and that's a really good indicator here. So we'll talk about each of these disorders that I'm trying to go through and the evaluation of them. Health provider should be able to characterize an infant or child's physiologic state within 30 seconds using a rapid cardiopulmonary assessment. This assessment begins with observation of the patient's mental status and interaction with their environment, while simultaneously noting airway patency, respiratory rate, and work of breathing. The quality of breath sounds, skin color, temperature and capillary refill, and the quality of both distal and proximal pulses are noted. Let's now look at some examples. The rapid cardiopulmonary assessment requires a consistent approach. Simultaneously observe the child's level of alertness, airway patency, and breathing. Is the airway clear or maintainable with non-invasive assistance? Assess the respiratory rate, effort, air exchange, and mucous membrane color. <coughs> Feel the skin temperature while you palpate the central and peripheral pulses. Note capillary refill and the patient's response to tactile stimulation. Uh, Note the intercostal retractions and increased respiratory effort. A high-pitched inspiratory sound is heard. This is strider, indicating upper airway obstruction. A forced, prolonged exploratory effort is also seen consistent with lower airways disease. Notice that a great deal of physiologic information can be obtained by simple observation. Observe the tachypnea, retractions, and nasal flaring in this infant. Initial auscultation of the chest suggests there are inspiratory releases, but listening over the trachea illustrates that the lung sounds were transmitted from the upper airway in this infant with strider. As you observe the child, note that the chest and abdomen should rise together during inspiration. Seesaw respirations, as seen here, often suggest airway obstruction. They may also be seen in patients with neuromuscular weakness. The weak chest muscles cannot oppose contraction of the diaphragm. This infant initially has strider on inspiration. In this case, the loss of noisy breathing is not a good sign. And there's an obstruction right now, watch. She's fighting it, fighting it, and she'll relieve it. When associated with deep retractions and seesaw movements of the chest and abdomen, it indicates progression from partial to complete airway obstruction. Note how the abdomen and chest move together when the obstruction is relieved. In this case, the child appears to be neurologically impaired, making assessment of mental status difficult. The child is dachypneic with good color, but upper airway obstruction is present due to excessive secretions and or inability to swallow effectively. Contrast the previous case to this infant with lower airway disease. This infant is not interacting and has obvious dachypnea with a prolonged expiratory phase. Lower airway disease, like asthma or bronchiolitis, often produces retractions, an oxygen requirement, and prolonged expiration. This child appears to have a reduced level of interaction with obvious tachypnea and an increased work of breathing. The expiratory phase is prolonged, consistent with lower airway disease, such as asthma. Wheezing is heard during auscultation of both sides of the chest. Unilateral wheezing may be heard in asthma, but if noted, the PALS provider should consider a foreign body airway obstruction. The presence of respiratory distress may be suggested by the degree of effort required to breathe. In this adolescent with asthma, note the retractions and use of accessory muscles of the neck. These are non-specific signs of respiratory distress. 
Note the irregular breathing pattern in this infant of intermittent high-pitched inspiratory strider, followed by periods of central apnea. That was scary. Yeah. Respiratory distress is often easy to recognize. Respiratory failure due to inadequate respiratory effort may be more subtle and requires careful patient observation. In addition to attention to the ABCs, initial assessment for shock includes bedside evaluation of skin and brain perfusion. This child with good color has a diminished level of consciousness with obvious tachypnea. There is no airway obstruction. If you listen, the child would have clear breath sounds with excellent air entry. This child with diabetic ketoacidosis illustrates typical Kussmaul breathing. There is no respiratory distress. Instead, the child is attempting to compensate for severe metabolic acidosis. Other signs of shock include a prolonged capillary refill. Normal capillary refill is demonstrated here and should generally be less than two seconds when the ambient temperature is normal. Here are some examples of children with shock and very delayed capillary refill. In shock, the extremities are often pale or mottled and cool to the touch. Late decompensated shock is not difficult to recognize and is characterized by decreased or absent responsiveness to the environment, weak or absent pulses, low blood pressure, and low urine output. In summary, by careful observation and a rapid examination, the rapid cardiopulmonary assessment, you can determine an infant or child's physiologic status. Use a consistent approach as illustrated in these examples of respiratory and circulatory distress. Finally, examination of the ill infant or child does not end when the rapid cardiopulmonary assessment is completed. These patients are often dynamic, so repeated assessments are necessary. Moreover, the completion of the rapid cardiopulmonary assessment may need to be interrupted to provide life-saving therapy such as opening the airway or assisting ventilation.